Good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, this evening to the American Turkish Friendship Association. My name is Jenna. I'm going to be the moderator for the discussion this evening. Before we get started, just a couple of things. Um, we're going to go ahead and have um, each speaker is going to speak for about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. And um, after that, uh, so it's about roughly 45-ish or 50 minutes, we'll have a Q&A with the audience. And so um, when that happens, we'll, if you could raise your hand, uh, and then a microphone will come to you. And uh, <coughs> if you could just stand up, uh, that'd be great. And say your name and uh, your affiliation, if you'd like. Secondly, if you would, please uh, turn your phones either off or on silent. And uh, thank you. We are recording. Sorry, they're pushing the back. Uh, we will be recording tonight's event, um, and so you will be able to view it via our websites um, in about a week's time. Podcast will be up uh, in a sooner time than that. Um, so, uh, the first, before we get started tonight, uh, the president of the Rumi Forum would like to say a few words. Uh, and welcome. So, Emre Celik, please welcome him. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you, uh, each and every one of you, on behalf of the American Turkish Friendship Association and the Rumi Forum. Of course, uh, many of you may know that the Rumi Forum is dedicated to uh, interfaith and intercultural understanding. Uh, that's part of our mission. And uh, what better way than to bring uh, three lovely people to discuss the very important topic of social justice according to the Abrahamic traditions. I want to thank them each, uh, each and uh, every one of them personally. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, uh, we look forward to their insightful remarks and thank you one and all for, for coming this evening. Thank you, Jenna. All right. Welcome again, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the second in our Abrahamic series discussion panels and the title of tonight's talk is Social Justice in Theology and Practice, the Abrahamic Traditions. Our first speaker tonight, and I will introduce them now, all of them, and uh, then we will begin. Our first speaker is Rabbi Batya Steinloff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Batya. Fatia is the Director of Social Justice and Interfaith Initiatives at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. Our second speaker of the evening is the Reverend Dr. Carol Flett, and she is the Ecumenical and Interreligious Officer for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. And she, <laughs> she is also the Chair of the Board of the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. And she's the President. And Ha Batia is the president. We're interchangeable. Yes. <laughs> Our third speaker tonight is Ms. Aisha Rahman, and she is the executive director of Karama, and also serves as the head of the organization's family law division. I highly recommend that you check this organization out. Um, so please welcome all of them. Ms. Batia. I hand it over. All right. uh, first, I'd like to say if you'd like to be on the board of the IFC, <laughs> <laughs> create the, the three. Sets. That's right. Uh, can you can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna give that back. Um, I want. Please forgive me. I'm getting over a sinus infection, so I'm not contagious, but I'm a little scratchy. Uh, uh, one of the funnest things about the Torah, and it's hard to think of it this way. Torah is the Hebrew word for Bible. I think a lot of the if I say anything in Hebrew or the, and I forget to translate, please let me know. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Torah that you don't think about, because when you think about scripture, it sounds very serious and very establishment, but the Torah is actually an incredibly subversive book. Right? If you think about the time, the time period that the Torah was given, the two major civilizations in the world were, <coughs> excuse me, in, in uh, 
what became Babel and what was Egypt. I mean, those were those were the ancient civilizations. That's where laws developed. That's sort of the nature of how, uh, you know, where it was all happening. And the Torah goes about the business of saying, we reject both of those places. They're just wrong. And when, when Abraham, when Abraham starts his journey, what does he leave behind? Because it's not, it's not enough. It's not, it, do, it doesn't understand God. He leaves Babel. And eventually we go to Egypt, and we leave Egypt. Like those two societies, they're idolatrous societies. They don't, under, they don't have that sense of what is right and what is wrong, and they're not good enough. And the Jewish people, I mean, usually when people make, like when people have foundational myths and, and an understanding about where they come from, they're usually rather elevated. <clears throat> but who does God choose? God doesn't make a people out of somebody particularly important. Right? The, the ancestry of the Jewish people isn't descended from kings. Right? We're descended from slaves. God chooses a slave people. You know, the, the lowest possible level in the most exalted society on earth. And those are the people that God says, and you are going to fulfill my vision here on earth. That's, that's a very countercultural idea in a society that wasn't a very countercultural society. If you look at the laws, and this is one of those things you do in rabbinical school in a progressive, in, uh, from a progressive perspective, if you look at the laws of, um, of Babel, um, that area, that they'll talk about if a poor person takes out a rich person's eye or a poor person kills a rich person, you get to kill, uh, or if, if somebody's, you get to kill, the punishment for the poorer person is much greater than the punishment for the richer person. Or if somebody's daughter is killed, you get to kill their daughter. And by the time you get to the Torah, that's done. Right. One of the, the central theme is that each and every one of us is created in God's image, not physical likeness, but in the sense of being able to choose between right and wrong and having a, a inherent holiness. We are all created in God's image. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're powerful. Everyone should be treated justly. Um, not only should everyone be treated justly, but you are supposed to argue for justice, even against God. When you get to the story of uh, Saddam and Amorah, the evil societies that God has decided to destroy, God tells Abraham in advance, and Abraham argues with God. How can the the God of justice do injustice. How can you behave unjustly? I mean, if you actually read the story, God doesn't change God's mind, right? Abraham actually loses the argument. But he makes it. Right? Even to God, you have to behave justly. And that's a radical idea. God, like God's a thing. But when, when it's an issue of justice, you argue for it. Um, and, and Moses does the same thing. God says, eh, enough. Enough with you people. You're really annoying. And Moses says, uh-uh. You made this deal. You, you are the God of this people. That time Moses wins the argument. But when God is going to act in a way that doesn't, that doesn't measure up to the standard, you have to argue with God because justice is more important. Um, if you read, <clears throat> when you read the Torah, this very central book, right, um, the center line of the Torah, has the phrase, you will love your neighbor as yourself. That's really an amazing central phrase. Right? And it doesn't say, <coughs> you know, that golden rule about you will treat other people the way you want to be treated, or you won't treat other people in ways you wouldn't want to be treated. This is actually a much higher level. You will love your neighbor like yourself. That's an incredibly difficult commandment. But that's what we're going for, is that when we look at one another, we are each and every one of us God's creation. And we each and every one of us need to be treated as God's creation 
of the sanctity because we are gods. And that whole, that whole central chapter, uh, it's Leviticus 19, it's called the Holiness Code. And it goes through a list of how you're supposed to behave. And <coughs> one of the interesting things about the list, it makes no distinction between ritual things and moral things. It will tell you, you know, how you're supposed to observe this holiday and what you're supposed to do on, you know, at this time of day. And then it will tell you, and you will leave the corners of your field untouched because that's for the poor. It's, it's built into the system. That you, you have to treat people that way. And that's part of how we are in the world and that is part of our relationship with God. You can't have that relationship with, the God, with God if you don't have that relationship with humanity. Um, when you read through the book of uh, Shemot, right, the story of the exodus from Egypt, over and over again we're told, why, why is it you're supposed to behave this way? Because God is God. Right? God is your God, so you behave morally. <coughs> At the beginning of the Holy Co this Code, it says, you will be holy because the Lord your God is holy. Right? It's part of an obligation to treat other people the way God would want us to. Because we are all God's creation. The other, also in the story of Exodus, which is the foundational story for the Jewish people, it's the story of Abraham, is the story of Abraham's family. But as we come out of Egypt, we become a people. We're no longer a family religion, but we become uh, a much more complex and complicated uh, entity with a much more complicated relationship with God. And over and over again, it says, you have to protect the stranger and the widow and the orphan. And I probably should have looked up how many times it says that, but I didn't. The stranger and the widow and the orphan are the most unprotected people in society. They don't have anyone there to take care of them. And in most societies, we count on our families. We count on our, the people we've known since we were kids. Those are the people who protect us and take care of us. us. Strangers, widows, and orphans, they don't have that protection. They're easily taken advantage of. They're easily hurt. But those are the people that we have to take care of. And again, there are two reasons. One, because God is your God. And the other reason is because you know what it's like. The experience of the Jewish people being slaves in Egypt is supposed to change who we are. We are supposed to have that empathy for all people who suffer because we know what it's like. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, certainly, as you go through the prophets, which I'm sure Carol will be talking about at length, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? it it continues that theme. You, what what does God want from you? God wants you to behave justly. The old is way out of Egypt. The first, right, he sees an Egyptian beating a slave, an ancient Egypt, uh, an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the slaves, and he kills the taskmaster. Master. Math, task master, sir. I won't even try that again. It, in de to defend the slave. So that's an argument between someone who is not Jewish, right? It's a conflict between someone who is not Jewish and someone who is. And the next time, the next day, he sees two Jews are, are arguing. And what does he do? He intervenes. And then after he leaves, when he defends Jethro's daughters, Jethro's daughters. He defends the daughters, and that was a dis that is a disagreement between, you know, people who have nothing to do with him. They're not part of his people, they're not part of his community, he has never seen them before. But the people he defends are the people who need defending. <coughs> and that text from the Torah helps us understand why Moshe is chosen to lead the Jewish people. Because he stands up for whoever needs to be stood up for. His relation to them, that's, that's not the point. And with the stories in the Midrash, what talks about why 
Moshe still is chosen? I mean, why does Moshe see the burning bush? Like, why, why does he get to that place? Well, <coughs> according to the rabbis, he was in that place because one of the lambs from his flock wandered away, and he, didn't, he needed to protect it. So when God saw Moshe go to save the lamb, he said, that's the man who should lead my people. Right? That sense, we, we're, we're there to protect. We, that is what makes you a leader is that commitment to justice. <clears throat> um, a line you'll hear often quoted, right? Tzedek, tzedek, tirdo, you will pursue justice. That's a little different than social justice. Right? That's that sense that you can't, you can't get to a world of kindness and moral, where your moral actions really matter until you can at least be fair. First you establish a just world, and then you also establish a compassionate world. Let me see what I've got to. The text of the rabbis, it talks about, the I believe this is in the Quran actually also. Sorry, the question is asked, why does God created everybody from Adam? Right? He could, God could have just made a whole bunch of people at once. It would have saved a lot of time, don't you think? Like one, two, two individual people to start the world, that's fairly time consuming. We have to do it that way. What's the purpose of that, the rabbis ask? If we are all descended from Adam, from one ancestor, nobody can say, my ancestor is better than your ancestor. You only have one all the same ancestor. We are all in it together. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to read you um, one of my favorite texts. Now this is from the Talmud, which is the collection of oral law that goes along with the Torah. I don't know if you've ever seen the Talmud sitting on a shelf. It's, excuse me. It's big, right? It's like this big. <laughs> like really. It's a very big book. Um, there's a lot in it, but this is one of my favorites. All who can protest against something wrong that one of their family is doing and does not protest is held account accountable for their family. All who can protest against something wrong that a citizen of their city is doing and does not protest is held accountable for all citizens of the city. All who can protest against something wrong that's being done in the whole world is accountable together with all citizens of the world. We all have the responsibility, not just to act justly ourselves, but to do our best to make sure the world is founded on justice. Um, I just want to talk for a minute about the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington, um, which is where I am very lucky to work, and about how the Jewish community is organized. Right, this idea of justice, for a lot of Jews, even for Jews who aren't affiliated with Jewish organizations or with synagogues or with the Jewish community, they'll tell you that's what they learned from their sense of being Jewish. That's their sense of Juda Judaism. That idea that you have to be just. Right, there's, a, there's a story, there's a book of stories about people's Jewish identities. And Justice Ginsburg talked about her experience in high school when one of her parents died. Excuse me. And she had to, and she, they wouldn't let her join in the prayers because she was a woman. Well, she didn't really like it, right? That was it for her. Her basic Jewish affiliation kind of ended then, right? Her sense of religious affiliation. But she'll tell you that sense of the obligation to act justly and morally that she held on to. That's her sense of Jewish identity. The Jewish Community Relations Council is the representative of Jewish community agencies. So there's over 100 different types of Jewish agencies that we represent. Um, and a lot of what we do is try to make sure that those organizations have what they need, the resources they need to run well. We do a lot of advocacy for it. So the Jewish organization has actually done a beautiful job as, of organizing and creating institutions to support 
people in the community who need support. All right, Jewish Social Service Agency provides um, classes and programming for the mentally disabled, emotionally disabled, um, they, they do job training. They're there to provide social services to people who need it. Um, the Hebrew Home for the Aged, which does not just accept Jews. All the Jewish agencies do not serve only the Jewish community, although they are designed to be comfortable for the Jewish community. So the Jewish Home for the Aged will accept everyone, but the all, the, all the food they serve is going to be kosher. Right. Um, there is reha rehab. There's, a, there's subsidized housing available. Um, there's Jewish group homes that provide independent living for the developmentally disabled. Um, there's Jakeda. I have no idea what that stands for, but they do, um, there are services for women who have been abused and for people who are suffering from domestic violence. Um, there is an imperative to organize to protect the community. Um, every kid preparing for their bar bar mitzvah is going to have a social justice project which is not easy, because who wants to let a 12-year-old do anything? <laughs> but there's an obligation to find your kid something they can do, because you can't become a responsible member of the community if you don't know that it's your responsibility to serve the community. Right? Serving the people who, need, who are in need, that is your obligation. Um, there are synagogue programs uh, my synagogue, Addis Israel, has an affiliated, uh, a, a group who are affiliated that provide apartments for the mentally ill. So they have a number of apartments that they maintain, and people live there, their rent is paid, and they're there for support. Uh, when you need, if you live in one of their apartments and you need something, you can call and say, help me. And somebody from, that, from the synagogue community will go and help them. And they're not affiliated with the community in any other way but they need it. And uh, there are different, there, every synagogue in Washington, D.C. has some different housing program. Um, some are, some are, I think, for, for women who, who need a home. Uh, but they, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember them all. They're all different, but every synagogue has one. Uh, Jewish Community Relations Council has been training synagogue lay leadership to go back to their communities to do food justice programming. So there's been everything from a community garden um, one woman is doing, it's called a farm to freezer program, where she finds vegetables that would have been thrown away, and she cooks them in tom tomato sauce, and then she either donates the tomato sauce to shelters, or she sells it and donates the money to shelters. Right? The, the, synagogue, the, the synagogues have, have different social justice programming, and different social justice councils, and they do outreach to communities because that's what we all need to do. And we may never actually manage via Haftorecha Kamoka, like looking into the, everyone's face and knowing that you need to love that person as much as you love yourself. That may be hard, but we try. At least on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it may not be on. Oh, it is on. It's not. That's right. I will holler. Hello. Hi. 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 I'm, uh, it recently had eye surgery, so I'm wearing my readers, and so I apologize for looking like a little old grandmother here, but hey, <laughs> for you to see the paper. Uh, I am one myself, so if I'm not really putting down grandmothers. So uh, you're receiving uh, one sheet of paper that's going to uh, be important in a few minutes. Um, I have some other handouts that we may use uh, um, at some other time where you can take home with you, but that one piece of paper is really going to be helpful for our discussion. Um, I want to sort of follow up on what uh, Bachi was saying at the beginning, too, about that the tradition, <coughs> as, as, it was, as the Jewish tradition developed, was countercultural um, and continued to be countercultural. <coughs> It's, it's an important for me to say, and it's, I'm always surprised at the number of people who don't know this, so don't be embarrassed if you didn't know this before. 
Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> um, I hear this all the time that people do not realize that. Christians don't realize that. Yesterday I was at a synagogue and some people said he was a Jew. I said, and someone said, who said that? <laughs> um, but because we just sort of think if you're non-Christian, you just don't you know, necessarily put that together. But Jesus was a Jewish young man, probably about the age of 30, when, when Jews, that young men were given permission, I understand, at that age to begin to speak. I mean, they weren't. Uh, I've never heard that. We heard that you had to wait till you were 30 or 33 to be able to. Teach. I've never known Jews not to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he began to, to, to begin his ministry at probably about the age of 30. And he was countercultural himself. He came out of a, a tradition that was uh, originally countercultural. Um, but he was living it at a time in uh, Palestine where um, there was a, as I've been told, and this may be, again, we're all learning our tradition from different sources, um, that it was living in a time when, if you can imagine a series of concentric circles, is the world was sort of conceived as a series of concentric circles. This, this very center of the circle um, was the temple. The Holy of the Holies was the center of that center. And then surrounding that would have been the religious leaders, and, uh, and then surrounding that would have been um, those who were um, the, those who were uh, among the educated. And as the circles went farther and farther out, you became the, the, the more the peasants, um, those who were tradesmen, uh, those who were sick, um, those who were um, widowed, those who were on the margins of society. And Jesus apparently was stirred by. The, 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 the concerns and the, the difficulties of those people living on the margins. And so almost all of the stories about what Jesus said and did were always trying to break through those concentric circles so that the people on the margins could be included into at least one earlier set of circles to sort of not necessarily move up in class, but it would be sort of equivalent to that. In other words, if you're sick, we will heal you so you can return to your community. Um, if you are poor, we'll find ways to feed you and to care for you so you will be able to, again, re rejoin your community. So it was a way to bring people back to the wholeness that, that they were created to be. Um, but it was also countercultural because in many ways the system was working with keeping the poor at the margins, keeping the sick at the margins, keeping the women at the margins. Um, and so he was trying to sort of break through those, uh, those boundaries. And so he did a lot of teaching. And I want to read to you what, uh, one, of his most, one of his most famous, or portion of one of his most famous sermons. In the, in the Christian Bible, there are four Gospels that are included, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke and Matthew are very, very similar. They think they actually grew out of the same source. Um, so they have very much the same uh, stories, but their, their language might be slightly different, slightly different vocabulary word, but the structure is very much the same. So when Moses, uh, when Matthew talks about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he's trying to present Jesus as, um, as like Moses, giving a sermon from a higher place down upon the people. When Luke tells the same story of Jesus giving his sermon, it's the Sermon on the Plain, where Jesus is standing among the people giving the same message. So it's a different kind of theological position over whether Jesus was like a Moses as a great leader standing you know, over thousands of people preaching, or whether he was among the people teaching. So this is from the Sermon on the Plain, <laughs> from the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. 
he's turning the world upside down. Mm -hmm. He's trying to reverse the si this situation to balance the justice in the world. And then he continues. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful and compassionate, just as God is merciful and compassionate. And it goes on and on. This is just the portion I wanted you to hear for this evening. So the church from the earliest times took these teachings of Jesus and did very much what Bashi was saying. We continue to reach out to those who are in need, the poor, the hungry, the sick, the marginalized. And so churches were originally developed from the very poor and the marginalized, the sick, um, and all of the people who were sort of left out in the margins. The early Christians were those people. They were the poor, the sick, the peasants. And so that's how the first community began to be developed. And then after a, a, you know, a couple of centuries where others were finding this kind of behavior admirable and they wanted to be part of that community, there began to be developed a process of how to become a Christian by learning about the teachings. In some ways, we're still doing it. We're all learning about how our founders or our tradition began and how we want to continue that tradition. And so with, when I was growing up, and most Christians can remember this if, you're, if you think back on it, we were taught that the individual congregation should always be generous and should be um, giving charity. So we would collect money for lots of different important um, causes, such as we collect food, or we collect clothing, or we collect money for things that we, we knew with, that other people needed to use the money to get. Um, and that was considered charity, and charity was considered a wonderful thing. And the people who did justice were the the, the, the institutional bodies of which the churches belong to. So that the National Episcopal Church, which would have much more collective power than an individual congregation, <coughs> they would have the opportunity to lobby in, in Congress for particular bills or acts that would change the system so that charity was sort of meets the immediate needs, but the justice would maybe perhaps change the system. Well then, about probably in the 60s, we began to realize that we shouldn't be relying on leaders or government leaders or institutional leaders to bring about justice. That individual people and individual congregations could also be just as engaged in, in justice. And going to the prophets, which I promised I would, I love to do that. Yes, love to <laughs> the Christians do lean heavily upon the prophets. We love them. They love them too, but we, we talk about them a lot. Um, one of our favorite prophets is Micah, um, and there's one, one passage that I actually used at my ordination as the, on the invitation, where um, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? If you ask a lot of Christians, if they remember that passage, generally what people remember is that they love justice and they will do kindness. But that's the catch. <laughs> We're supposed to do justice and love kindness, not love justice and do kindness. Because <laughs> doing kindness doesn't necessarily change the system. It just meets the immediate need. So what I've given you to look at, and now I'd like you to turn to, is that one piece of paper that compares the difference between charity and justice. 
And this is where churches are much more now actively involved in social change by understanding the difference between charity and justice. So charity on the left is equivalent to social service. Charity provides direct services like food, clothing, and shelter. Justice provides social change. Justice promotes social change in institutions or political institutions. Charity responds to immediate needs. Justice responds to long-term needs. Charity is directed at the effects of injustice and symptoms. Justice is directed at the root of social problems. Charity addresses problems that already exist. Justice uh, addresses the underlying structures or causes of these problems. Charity can be private, individual acts. And justice is public, it's collective actions. And examples of charity are homeless shelters, food shelters, clothing drives, and emergency services. And I remember there was a great story when we lived in Boston where there's a rather large homeless, um, it's hardly a shelter, it's, it was a former factory that was turned into a shelter for the homeless, particularly in the wintertime. And it would hold on an, on an evening, you know, 500 people. Um, and the problem was that the poverty was increasing and the homelessness was increasing. And so there were efforts to build a bigger shelter. And then there were those that said, we're looking at this problem the wrong way. <laughs> we need to find these people homes, not build bigger shelters. Mm -hmm. And so the charity part is, is important. It's immediate needs. You can't leave people freezing. You've got to build a, a shelter but you need to have just as much or more action and funds and, um, and awareness to change the reasons why people are homeless. So that to go into things such as job training, um, building houses, um, providing um, medical needs for people who don't have access to them, those are systemic changes. Um, and we're continuing to look at increasing ways to change the system that's leading to the problems. So I think this is what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't necessarily just talking about feeding the hungry, but it's like that old myth or legend or story about you, if, you, if you give a man a fish, he eats for one day. If you teach him how to fish, he can eat for the rest of his life. So we need to do more job training, more education, more helping people to grow their own foods if they're in places where that's possible. Everything to sort of change the reasons why people are hungry and homeless and ill. So what's happening now is that the Episcopal Church and most um, Christian churches have outreach projects within their church that are definitely dealing with local needs, you know, charity-based. We're not throwing out charity, but mm -hmm. there also are people within a, a congregation or in the larger diocese that are working on the systemic changes. And I think some of it has to do with what you as an individual feel you want to do and feel called to do. Some people, um, are wonderful, for example, at knitting hats for babies in, in uh, um, you know, in, in neonatal facilities and hospitals. And that's something they can do at home, privately. It's, it's wonderful. Other people might be trying to see if they can expand or improve the neonatal care in the hospital, and that may be where their skills and their um, their resources are leading them. So I think every person has to sort of choose which way they are best suited to make a difference in the world, whether it's something they can do privately as charity or something that they can do systemically and make differences in our social uh, environment. I'm going to stop there. And the other thing, these are, um, these are passages from the Christian scriptures and a few from the Hebrew Bible um, about where, our, where the, the roots of our understanding about justice come from. So we'll pass these out. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Aisha. Well, alaikum, everyone. May peace and blessings be on all of you this evening. I think that my remarks kind of flow, I think, well. It's so interesting to me. It's not really interesting anymore, but how much of our traditions are so similar. I feel that my stories that I'm going to share uh, are very similar to what you've already heard, but I will continue nonetheless. 
When I think about social justice in the Islamic tradition, it seems really obvious to me that justice, whether it be social or otherwise, really is the core of Islam. At Karama, we spend a lot of time, my organization, and I can talk about Karama later, but uh, at Karama, one of the things that we teach when we talk about Islam, especially Islamic law, is that you have to look at Islam holistically. Every action or belief means something. It has a significance to another and is relative to another concept. And Adil, or Adala, the world word for justice in Arabic, is really a central tenet of Islam. And so everything that you do, every action, every dealing, goes back to this core of Islam, or of core of justice. So when I was trying to think of an analogy, if I were explaining it to a kid, and they may not understand this analogy, but justice is like the hub of a wheel. And there are so many spokes that come out of it, such as how you deal with your parents, or inheritance rights, or custody rights, or so many other things. But justice is at the core, even animal rights, and how you treat animals. Um, and if you threaten one spoke of that wheel, you are threatening to leave the entire world or cosmos at, uh, at destruction because you're destroying the very core of that wheel. So there's a verse in the Quran, and I'm going to give you several. And forgive me, I don't have the Quran memorized, so I'm actually going to read uh, several uh, verses. If you want the citations, I can give them to you after. God says that the very reason why he revealed the Quran is to ensure that justice is served. And I think that that's a really, uh, a point that's worth repeating. That the only reason he revealed the Quran was to see that justice is served in this world. He says, we, as in God, have already sent our messengers with clear evidence and sent down with them the scripture and the balance that the people may maintain their affairs in justice. And he goes on to say, O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, God, witnesses in justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. And then he commands, be just that is nearer to righteousness. So how does this apply to social justice? What is social justice? I think it goes beyond just your dealings with people immediately around you. So a judge must be just in her rulings. A leader must be just in her dealings with people. A parent must be just in their parenting. But social justice, as we've come to know it, is to go beyond those immediately around you and to look at the community as a whole. So when I was younger, my mom taught me an oft-repeated hadith. Of course, uh, a hadith, for those of you who don't know, are sayings of the Prophet, and this is a sahih hadith. Um, though I didn't know that it was a hadith. She didn't say that it was a hadith. One day I came home from school. I was five years old. I was in kindergarten. And I had witnessed Terrence, a young boy in my class, being paddled on the behind. I come from uh, a little town in Tennessee. It's a little farming town, Loudoun, Tennessee. And paddling, indeed, although I'm not very old, it was still a part of practice in, uh, in Loudoun, Tennessee. Um, Anyway, I, I witnessed this and I was so upset and I went home and I was crying and I told my mom that I didn't really like Terrence. In fact, uh, one nap time he had tried to kiss me on my cheek and I <laughs> cried furiously and left the room and, and screamed at him and really did not really like him. Uh, but still, in my five-year-old mind, I knew that he was still a kid, and no matter what mistake he had made that day, and I don't remember the mistake that he had made, hitting him or paddling him with a ping pong paddle seemed wrong. And I didn't say anything, and I felt guilty for not saying anything, and I felt shame for having seen this. And so my mom said to me, if you believe in your heart that it was wrong, then you don't need to feel bad. 
And as I got older, I realized that this was part of a hadith that was actually much bigger. And that hadith is this. If you see something wrong, and this is a paraphrase, if you see something that you hate, do something to modify it with your hand. And if you don't have the strength to modify it with your hand, then hate it with your tongue and say something about it. And if you can't do that, hate it in your heart, and that is the least of faith. My mom knew that I had a heart for social justice, but she also knew that at five years old, I wasn't going to say anything to my teacher. I wasn't going to lead a revolution, though I maybe could have. But I could hate what happened in my heart, and that was enough. So this is where I kind of go transition into justice in action. So it's one concept to think about how God created the world to be just and that the world order is surrounded by justice. But is that justice in Islam just a silent believing something is wrong, holding the world to be just, just in your mind? No, there's actually an action behind it. And so, and similar to the story that the rabbi shared in the Talmud, in chapter four of the Quran, God says, O oh, you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God even as against yourselves, your parents, your kin, whether it be against rich or poor, for God can protect both. Follow not the desires of your heart, lest you swerve, and lest you distort justice or decline to do justice, because God is acquainted with all that you do. I have to say at this point, I'm not a scholar of Quran or of Hadith, but one thing that I have come to know in my study of Islam is that you cannot look at any verses or any one Hadith in silos. You can't look at it in a vacuum. The Quran is a seamless web of information. Everything relates to another. And so I think that you need to look at justice similarly. So let me give you some examples. The first example is for those who love the law, and I am a lawyer. A couple years ago, Karama was invited to go to the Maldives to talk about domestic violence from an Islamic perspective. The Maldives is a 100% Muslim country. It's a collection of islands in the Indian Ocean. And when we got there, I'm not gonna talk about DV just yet, we noticed that one of the um, common practices was that women were being flogged in the public square. And so we thought, well, what's that about? And so we investigated and found out that those women had been convicted of zina, and zina is adultery or fornication. I'm not going to go into what zina is, that's a whole separate conversation. But what was interesting is, to me is the justice behind the process. So the law, the body of law in the Maldives, because it's a Muslim country, is based on Sharia, which is Islamic law, or what they knew of it. If you accuse another of zina, you have to produce four witnesses to the actual act that has occurred. Not only that, but scholars have interpreted this even further to say that if one person comes in and testifies and says that the man was wearing white and the next witness says the man was wearing red, then the testimony is not corroborated and there would be no punishment. And in fact, the justice, I think, is beautiful in this concept, that the accuser is then punished because they wrongly accused, and it is wrong to accuse somebody of something so abhorrent as adultery. So we always have to look at, when we look at law, we have to really understand the justice behind it and whether the level of investigation that God tells us to do is actually happening. So I've talked a little bit about how Karama is involved in domestic violence work. We do a lot of gender justice work. And the topic in Muslim communities, I'm always surprised, is some, one that is met with a lot of discomfort. 
uh, people, especially uh, who people who see it as a man versus woman thing, thing that uh, we're already accusing our men of, our men are already so targeted. They're being profiled. They're uh, being stopped and frisked uh, around the world. They're being surveilled. You know, do we really need to down on them more by talking about how they're abusing their spouses? Um, in fact, of course, we should be talking about it. And so we at Karama issued, uh, amongst the many things that we do is we issue research and we issue articles um, on various issues. And one such concept is that of Sutter. So the last, I don't know if uh, you all are on our listserv, but we issued a um, Islamic law release not too long ago. And it's on this issue of Sutter. So, Muslims are taught that if you see somebody doing something wrong, similar to zina, it's better to cover somebody else's sins. It's better to hide somebody's sins than to display them and gossip and say, I saw so-and-so doing this, I saw so-and-so doing that. And the concept behind that is actually very nice. There is a hadith that says, if you cover somebody else's sin, God will cover yours. And that's very nice. So what happens if you witness an injustice or a crime? Does Sutter still apply? No, it does not. That's not me answering, that is our scholars answering. But no, because that would be inherently unjust. And why? Scholars have said that you can forgive someone for their sin against you, but if they have sinned against others, that is not within your right. So uh, amongst their justification, the, the jurist justification for this, or one verse in the Quran, which says, and do not conceal testimony, for whoever conceals it, his heart is indeed sinful, and God knows what you do. So Sutter is limited by victim's rights. If an act of Sutter perpetuates injustice to a victim, then it is prohibited. So, does justice only apply in gender justice situations? I've been talking a lot about gender issues, and that's what uh, that's what I do all day. So I I always think of gender situations to bring this to. Um, as I've repeated often uh, in this conversation. You can't look at justice in a silo. It's not only applicable to one area or another. In one of the most relevant pieces on justice, and this is similar, again, to the uh, Sermon on the Mount or of the Plain, there is a very famous sermon of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he talks about justice. It is his last sermon to us. And of all the things that he could have talked about, and he could have talked about many things, there are many things in Islam that he could have mentioned, there were two things that he really harped on. One is that we should stand for justice for the oppressed, and specifically who are the oppressed, but women and orphans, or widows and orphans, some people think, which is similar to what was already said. And then he talked about racial equity. So he knew that his people were going to be racist. That's just how we are. And he said, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No white is superior to a black. Those were maybe not issues that they were even dealing with at that time. And yet he told us about that before he left. And in the um, beginning of the khutbah or the sermon, he says, Go and spread this message wide because I will not be with you much longer than this. So what are we doing to advance racial justice or justice for the oppressed? Well, God answers that for us as well. He already said that you need to advance justice with your hands, through your work, through your tongue, through your heart. But also, he says, you need to put your money where your mouth is. And he says that there are, that one of the central uh, pillars of Islam is that you need to give zakat, or charity, which was translated. And there are eight protected classes for whom you need to give zakat, and they are 
the poor, the needy, the administrators of the of uh, zakat, which I thought was interesting when you talked about the church administering yeah. the um, services. Uh, those who have recently converted to free slaves, those who are in debt for any cause of God, and those who are stranded in journey. So in case there was any mystery about who we were to protect, God also lets us know that these are <coughs> who you need to protect. So there are so many social justice causes around the world that Muslims have started. And I know that there's a practical portion to this talk. And so I really uh, thought it unfair to mention only a few, but I will only mention two. Um, the first is, I was really uh, inspired by this, and I feel it's so simple in concept, but I was very inspired by this. Uh, last year, I traveled to Beirut with uh, the Karama's founder, uh, Dr. Aziz al <coughs> Beirut is her hometown. And we visited a group called Ashagaluna, which is, um, I don't actually know what it means, but uh, it's a women's empowerment project. So it's led by Muslim women to help Muslim women in Lebanon. And what they do is very simple. They, the women that they are helping are all widows or divorcees or <coughs> victims of abuse. And they have been disenfranchised financially because of uh, similar to what we were talking about earlier, the idea that <coughs> for whatever reason, if they were not, did not work before, did not have uh, labor before, they were dependent on their husband uh, or their partners, their parents, they've been disenfranchised and they don't have any op economic opportunities anymore. Instead of just giving them a handout, this organization trains them on their own skills. So as uh, the Reverend has already said some people have skills in knitting, some people have skills in uh, making preserves, some women have uh, embroidery skills, some women had sewing skills, whatever they were. And this group actually had it, has a store in a busy part of Beirut, and you can go and buy the wares that are made by the women. And above the store is a workshop where they train and uh, make sure that there's quality control. And I was really inspired by this because in my daily work as an attorney uh, representing victims of abuse, I noticed that one of the main reasons why women don't leave their abuser is because of the financial uh, aspect. You know, they know that if they leave, they may not be able to afford rent, They may, especially around here where the rent is so high. Uh, they may not be able to get a job, they may not be able to do much of anything, and so they don't leave. And so they are left in victim, uh, being victims for a very long time. So anyway, Ashkaluna is a really interesting, good example. Uh, the second group I want to talk a little bit about is Karama EU, and the only affiliation that they have with us is that all of the women that began Karama EU and formed it um, were graduates of our summer program. So Karama has a summer program uh, every summer for three weeks where we uh, educate Muslim women on Islamic law, leadership, and conflict resolution. And anyway, these Belgian women, uh, over the course of five years, came in droves and went back and formed Karama EU. And recently, we heard, and those of you who follow the news have probably heard about this, but there are secondary schools in Belgium that have banned young women from wearing the headscarf. And so uh, they have actually engaged in a lawsuit against the uh, government that has banned the headscarf. And why is that relevant to, uh, of course we know that's relevant to social justice, of course it's a civil rights issue, but I want to talk a little bit about the economic issue that's there. So if you take a young girl and tell her you can't cover your hair and go to school, and she wants to cover her hair, you're robbing her of the opportunity to get an education. And so she has to find means of an education elsewhere. If a girl 
takes it off, doesn't want to wear it, doesn't wear the headscarf so that she goes to school, but meanwhile is feeling guilty because she feels like she must do that as a religious tenant, she's also being, uh, psychologically, that is impacting her education, her relationships with people, the way she looks at herself. And so this is a horrible example to set for uh, limiting a woman, a young girl's access to education and future opportunity for job placement, etc. You already know that she's going to be discriminated against. And in fact, some of the, of the older women in Karama EU are struggling with finding jobs because they're being discriminated against for the way that they dress. And that's just not right. So I'm going to end on a final note. I'm happy to have been invited here today to talk about social justice. And the reason really is selfish in part. And it's selfish because since I arrived at Karama over two years ago, everyone sees our title, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. And they assume that we are a women's organization and they often wonder out loud to me, why are you doing civil rights work? And why are you doing religious freedom work? It doesn't make sense. You should be doing women's stuff, all that women's <laughs> issues. You should be doing that. And so it seems to me the answer is actually quite simple. Karama means dignity. There's a verse in the Quran uh, where God says that he has given dignity to all the children of Adam. And this is what you are talking about, the very central. We all come from Adam and Eve, and he has given, given dignity to all of us, regardless of any other difference. So if justice is holistic, ju injustice against any one group, whether it be a gender or a race or a religion of people, that affects everyone's dignity. And since dignity is God-given, shouldn't we advocate for it? Mm -hmm. I think yes. Mm -hmm. to depart. I'm maybe going to push it till about 8.10, um, but if you have to depart at 8, feel free, obviously. Um, and if you would like to sign up for emails from um, the American Turkish Friendship Association, if you don't already receive them, you should already receive them if you receive this invitation, however, but you could have gotten it from Ruby Form as well. I know some people in the audience did. Um, at any rate, uh, you can sign up. There is also um, a International Women's Day event coming up. This is kind of the um, you know pre-show. Uh, you know, I'll just take that liberty <laughs> calling it that, uh, even though we're still in February. Um, but uh, on the eighth uh, of March, and so they'll they'll be having a so watch out for the um, event announcement. I think Sharon Bolova, who is the uh, chairman chairwoman, chairman of uh, Fairfax County um, will be speaking at that event. So keep an eye out for it. So ladies, I want to um, I want to address, uh, I want to go back and um, kind of address the overall theme, which is what I I guess I, I interpreted and I got out of the talk, which was, you know, you know, you love for your neighbor what you love for yourself. Um, do good for others that you, you know, do to others what you would want to have done to you. Uh, this, this sort of same theme is, is, is throughout. And this, uh, in my understanding, um, it goes back to what Bhatia said, if I understood you correctly, which is our relationship with God. And so, and seeing God's image, okay, within everyone and loving everyone, um, all of, all, no, no, all human beings, all creation, of course, but specifically our fellow human being. So, uh, with that said, I think I think it just I think it all goes, you know, hand in hand. And then with what Aisha said about oppression, I, I guess 
you know, for me, when I think about oppression, and, and I know in, in Islam it says oppression is worse than killing. And why, you know, they're, they're saying this, it's worse than killing. And so um, why is that? Because when somebody is oppressed, they are not able to have their true relationship with their creator, and then so doing they cannot have a true relationship with, with, with their fellow human being, with their brother and sister in humanity, okay? Uh, so not only within our respective traditions, but within humanity. So, uh, and then if, you know, we're oppressed, you know, justice is not being fulfilled, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know, um, that, that's not necessarily a question, I, I just kind of gave you my feedback, but if you could, um, if, you, if you have any comments about, about that in terms of, you know, love for your neighbor, what you love for yourself, and in terms of seeing and, and how that relates to justice, um, per se, in, in our relationship with God. So, um, so I actually was, uh, before I came here, I was uh, sharing my remarks with an intern at Karama, and I was telling her that what I think, and this is sort of an evolution of my own faith and as I think about things, what I'm noticing so often in the Muslim community, if I may, is that, again, we like to put Islam in a box. So if you pray and, and you fast and you give to some causes, uh, you're a good Muslim. And then if you, uh, Dr. al Hippery actually gave a talk several months ago and I wish I had uh, her remarks, I don't remember them exactly, but uh, she talked about how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to um, a camel, he saw a camel once that was uh, chained up and he was crying. Uh, he had a tear coming down and the prophet asked the person who was taking care of the camel, what is wrong with the camel? And he was ashamed and he said, uh, oh no, nothing, you know, he's fine, he may be hungry, I don't know. And so the prophet said, he's thirsty, bring him some water. And I found that story to be so interesting because we talk about Islam sometimes too simply, too simply to say, okay, you need to pray and you need to fast and you need to do these things. And then that's it. And everything else in the world can keep continuing as it does. And that's not really accurate because if you believe that justice is a part of Islam, then injustice against an animal, uh, injustice against um, someone who trips in front of you because they fell on a sidewalk because of the ice, you know, whatever it is, that has to extend. Uh, being Muslim is not just these things. And so I think that an oppression, you know, I. Um, <coughs> helped a client once, uh, this is actually in Tennessee before I came here, um, I sort of had that, uh, the rose in my eyes I think was taken away as soon as I became a lawyer. Um, I learned things about my community that I didn't really want to know. Um, I never really thought that domestic violence occurred in the Muslim community. I came from a very small community and most of my clients were white. And I noticed in Ramadan one uh, night that a man was vacuuming after the iftar dinner. And I thought, oh, that's nice. He's taking care of the carpet and we're going to pray on that. That's nice. And then the next week I saw him in court and he was there with his wife and he had been abusing his wife for quite some time. And she had pictures and she had plenty of evidence. It wasn't just uh, made up. And I thought, is that Islam, where you go to the mosque and you care so much about the mosque and you're there at uh, Ramadan and you're praying and you're cleaning and then <coughs> you're going home and abusing your wife? And is that not oppression? Is that not oppressive of you? Um, and in fact, it is. And so I think we need to, we as in Muslims, I think need to expand our view of what oppression actually is and what it means to be faithful in our relationship to the Lord. 
But I think at the end of the day, as you said, you know, it, 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 it stops us not only from having that relationship, that true relationship with our Lord and, and then our fellow human beings, but it, 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 it stops us from serving. And I, I think that, that it's that taking that, that step for, you know, it's not about, as you said, just the practices and, and you know, doing A, B, and C and, and everything will be fine. You know, it's all well and good. Those things are all, of all good, of course, uh, but uh, it, it's 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 not fulfilled unless it's taken that step further in, in, in service. You know, we can have dialogue, we can learn about each other, we can love one another, but if we're not helping one another, if we're not taking that a step further, I mean, that is a service in and of itself for a greater community to learn about one another. But essentially, we should be trying to better our humanity. We should be trying to serve justice, uh, serve mm -hmm. serve humanity for justice. Um, and seek justice. So. Yeah, I, I want to comment on uh, this, take a slightly different direction. So I'm personally really troubled. I keep thinking about this uh, situation in Arizona. <laughs> My husband's tired of talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm but, sure he's but there's a movement in, this, in the state of Arizona, and the law has not yet been signed by the governor of Arizona, that would allow a person in a store to refuse to serve a customer in the store who they believed was a gay couple. But the premise is that they want to say, because that person's lifestyle offends my religious beliefs. Well, if that passes, that changes everything. That means <coughs> that you wouldn't serve a Hindu, because a Hindu they might think is polytheistic or whatever they might think of the Hindu and say, well, I'm not going to serve Hindus either because they're offensive to my religious tradition. I mean, that just gives us permission to be unjust because we think we're being just because we're defending our rights, mm -hmm. but we're actually creating oppression. Yes, that's not a measurable others. variable. That's You can't yeah. measure you know, how you're going to offend. That's yeah. a personal. But you're you sort know. of standing up for your rights. Right. You know, but I always thought that the law goes, my rights go as far as as they are, except when they start to affect your rights. <laughs> right. Um, and so I see this, you know, and apparently this, this same issue came up in Kansas, apparently, mm -hmm. sometime earlier, where people are beginning to stand up for what they think are their rights, mm -hmm. um, which are setting boundaries between mm -hmm. themselves and others whom they mm -hmm. think are offensive. Uh, and that just worries mm -hmm. me to be in this country where we believe in freedom of speech and freedom to assemble and freedom of the press and freedom of religion, <laughs> that we're starting to create this kind of okay attitude to be um, setting up boundaries that are actually being oppressive to other people and thinking that we're justified by it. So I just throw that out. You're the lawyer. Maybe you have some good thoughts. Well, I actually, I had a thought that's similar but different. Uh, one of the things that's been horrifying to me in the last couple of months is uh, and in relation to your rights versus another's is this idea of staying your ground yes. in Florida. Yeah. Um, it is harrowing how black males' blood is so cheap in this country. And so many, I've read so many news stories of people, of young men, mostly men, there was one woman as well, who have been killed because they happen to be on somebody's property. And the young woman, actually, I read a story where uh, her car had broken down and her cell phone battery had died. And so she went looking for help, knocked on a door, was walking away, and a man shot her. And it was defended by stand your ground because your property, your yeah. home, needs to be protected at all costs even by lethal force. I mean, I think this is really uh, kind of crazy. It's um, back to the wild it's west, right. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I think that it's, so my rights, my rights to uh, protect my property means I can kill you if you're on my property, yeah. and you may be threatening me, but why? What, what was she doing? Walking, yeah. you know, <laughs> on your sidewalk? I don't understand. And so... It just seems to be so so interesting, this idea of individual rights versus the, the other. other. Yeah. I think it's also that idea of being the victim. But because all these things have in common, I'm the victim. Those people, by being gay in my store, whether they're infringing on my religious rights, or this person by walking on my <coughs> my front steps is in my space, and poor little me. And it's all about, it, it's extremely narcissistic. 
I, I once heard somebody. It's self righteous. <laughs> and it's and it's very frightening as a religious person. It's very disturbing to hear these things justified as well. Religion says I can. Yes. And Sincerely I, held religious beliefs is the, the quote in the law. I once heard someone say, "Being religious doesn't make you good." First, you have to be good, and then you can be religious. Mm -hmm. You don't get to claim to be religious if you're not primarily good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm going to hand it out to you, and uh, I believe do we have some. Um, yes. Uh, I believe so. Omar, can you help with the Q and A with the microphone? This one's dark. Yeah, I think it's here. Thank you. Okay, so hands up, please. Again, my apologies. All right, yes. Do you want me to stand up? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maya. Um, I wanna, um, I want to ask each of you to, um, to give us suggestions about pra the practice of. of social justice. So we as individuals, what can we do within our own tradition um, as individuals? So, um, the, 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 um, so we compare charity and social justice. I'm wondering what are the practicalities of doing social justice would be in this context. If you could offer us some suggestions, please. Um, I think I think one example that we have, which has been given to us by the Bill of Rights, uh, is that we can assemble and collectively speak, using our tongues, as you, as you say, um, to, to speak out against an injustice. And that's been used from this time of the, earlier, but, I mean, but in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, um, there, there was a wonderful example of this I just wanted to share. And some of you may have, Taliba or Jenna may have witnessed to this, but do you remember in New York, when there was such protest against the construction of the Islamic Center near Ground Zero. And there was such protest there. Well, there was a, um, a protest against a protest in Washington. And it was gathered by um, a number of Christian clergy um, in Washington who gathered to protest the protest, to advocate our <laughs> freedom of religion, uh, our, our right to be able to build places of worship, you know, according to zoning and legal reasons, but yes, we had a right to do that. And it was um, it was filmed on, on network television, and I guess it was picked up by Al Jazeera. <coughs> it was shown in um, Pakistan, and I had done an international interfaith dialogue with some Pakistani leaders. They saw it, <laughs> and they contacted us back to say how marvelous it was that in this country we could speak out publicly and clearly about an injustice uh, without fear of uh, arrest or, but is that, but to, to counter, that was a counter to a, an obnoxious protest. So we have that kind of dialogue, if you want to call it, and I, and I think that's what makes social change. I think also as congregational leaders, we, we cannot preach politics, but we can preach justice. And so we can help our congregants um, not who to vote for, but how to vote by giving them some principles about justice um, and what are the issues and how we might look at those issues. So we can influence the thinking and the voting of members of our congregation. So that's one way to make social change, because then you're electing leaders to, that will vote in Congress um, that, that do make those significant changes. Um, or locally, you can advocate locally with religious leaders and for your mayor or your uh, city councils uh, to make changes that, that would change a system <coughs> in a town. So I do think that speaking out collectively um, is, is cheap. It sometimes doesn't involve the expenditures of money, it's just time and, and courage and I think that's one way that this country has made a lot of social change. Well, I, it, this isn't really different from what Carol said, so I probably shouldn't keep talking, but uh, it, that, that same idea of establishing 
a society that ju that's just as well as doing justice in your personal interactions. Mm -hmm. well, we can we can all feed the hungry. You know, we can volunteer at a food bank or make sandwiches or give money to somebody who's hungry, and we need to do that. But it, it's really about creating the society where we don't need to do that anymore, and that's mm -hmm. ultimately the goal. I think uh, just uh, really quickly because I see another hand. I think um, specifically in the Muslim community, if I may. Uh, one of the things that I see an incredible need for is the creation of social services uh, within the mosque structure or uh, at other community centers. And I think that one of the things that we fail to talk about often when we are with one another is to avail yourselves of the justice that is available to you in this country. You have to know about it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our communities and our uh, people who are going to worship at our mosques, especially say they are immigrants, if they have language access issues, if they have immigration issues, if they have uh, financial issues because they don't have a uh, legal right to work, um, they don't have uh, English as a second language, I mean, that's just one uh, demographic of people, of Muslims in, in this uh, community. You cannot avail yourselves of the justice that is available, you know, through the court, through the court system, or through uh, whatever other, you know, um, services you may need. And so I think that we need to practically give a little bit of attention to that, and we can talk more about that because Karama can can help. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, mine is not questions, uh, kind of comment or addition. Uh, this kind of follow up by Aisha's last remarks about uh, a person who was uh, kind of acting differently. Uh, and uh, it is from the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right before he was passing away, it's a kind of his last days, uh, everything was pretty much sealed down, so, so he gave everything to society. Uh, kind of all the you know the fundamentals of the uh, uh, the system, but he was insisting only one thing. So he was kind of last uh, message or last advice. It was about the uh, uh, the spouses or the family family members, and he was telling his followers, uh, you should respect the rights of your uh, your spouses and, and other people under your family. Not just once, not just twice, and over and over again. And some people around have said that, you know, I was a little bit kind of terrified, so I don't know how to, because it's the last wish, uh, last recommendation, or last uh, kind of uh, comment. So if you go to the core of the Islamic belief, uh, so it starts from the person, person's heart, then the person's personal life, and his relationship with his family, then it just goes outside of things. Maybe that is the missing part. Uh, it is uh, maybe we, yeah, we don't know that uh, we'll do that. Much, I mean. uh, another thing that uh, this may be a question. Uh, so we are talking about uh, fixing this, uh, the problems of the society. So kind of quick and easy fix a uh, charity. This person is hungry, just feed him. Or that person is in need of shelter. So this is good. It has to be done. No question about that. And the long term is the, you know, the, the justice. But I was wondering if you look at the, the real source of the problem. All these people that are coming from the families, they, you know, they at least used to have a family. So what happened to that family? Where it gone? Why they are homeless? Why they are separated? So uh, we should go and seek uh, the source of the problem so we can solve it in the center so it will, it will have a ripple effect on the soul that and so that people, as you can say that, I mean, uh, you, know, you, you can feed the people, but it's a temporary solution. You cannot feed them all the time. As she said that, you know, we have to teach them how to catch a fish in, in this approach. Maybe, you know, if you, know, you, you are representing different religions. So maybe the core of the problem, it is uh, not the one that we see and the front face. Maybe it is right behind, uh, behind uh, maybe something about the, 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 the belief, uh, the, the, the faith, uh, maybe. If that can be strengthened, so people maybe get along, and then we may not gonna see that much uh, kind of uh, uh, problems in our society. You know, I, I, I make a comment, then I might ask my husband to say something. Um, because I think my, my husband volunteers at two different agencies that help the homeless. And I think one of the things that we've all learned dealing with the homeless is many people don't have families. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it isn't that they have a problem in their family, it's just that they were in prison and they're out and they lost contact with family. Or they had a dreadful family experience and they don't have a family to return to. So that there isn't always, as we would hope, people had families that could you know, bring them back into the fold. Um, but my husband can maybe, you know, George, can you want to some, one of the things you, because you know, he, he talks with the homeless personally about how to improve their lives. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved with two organizations. I volunteer there. I'm fortunate enough to be retired, so I have time to do these things. I mean, I can't make any excuses. I have to face up to the things I need to do uh, and that my religion tells me to do. But um, what I find is that, that I deal with, with probably 80% men, uh, probably about 80% of the total people I see are, are homeless. Um, and it very much gets at that, that issue of um, <clears throat> helping people immediately but teaching them how to fish. Because um, I very quickly find, although I'm here to help them write a better resume to get a job, I also find that it's important for me to talk about the whole process and how you get back into society and how you have a chance to get back on track and to make people feel better about themselves. Because what, to your point, what so often happens is there's so many <coughs> disenfranchised people either from society as a whole or, or from a family structure that their self-esteem is very low and you need to have them see the goodness uh, in them and then give them practical ways to feel good about themselves to get back on their feet. And it's a, it's a very deep, deep problem. And obviously the organizations all around this country that work on it, one organization is very, that I work with is very much Christian and religious backed and mostly a, a, the Episcopal denomination. But another one is, is really secular that has help from all different types of, of organizations. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's a problem that has to be attacked from so many different angles. And we have to be willing to, as a society to put the funding and to put the emphasis around the things that will allow us to help rebuild the, the structure that, that these folks so, so lack. And I might, I might say there's something um, that goes far deeper uh, because a high percentage of the people I see, and this is back to the comment about it seems that African American men's lives are so cheap, it goes all the way back to the roots of the problem of slavery in this country. And for um, people with, with my background whose skin is fair and who control the means of the economic means. For a Christian, as Carol said, um, we have to have our hearts to the poor and the marginalized. In this country, I think it's doubly important because the people who have dominated the society are, are people that look like me with a European background and so forth. So, um, so I've covered a lot of ground, but I just want to give you a sense of what's out there and how some of my fellow volunteers and some of the, the people that are professionals at this and social uh, service organizations view the problem. But as religious people, I think uh, it behooves all of us, all of our denominations to do that. Thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, um, I guess mine isn't really directly a question, but if you could comment on it. Um, uh, what troubles me the most, especially being in D.C. right now, and kind of in the international sphere, uh, I see a lot of the world literally, you know, burning, protests, people killing one another. And you see this, like you said, if you see injustice, you know, try and do something about it. But I almost feel like my hands are tied and I really can't. I mean, we can sit here and talk about it and have panel discussions and, you know, this is all great, but what can we really do? I'm from Bosnia and right now there's a lot of protests and a lot of people are being killed and injured and this is the first time since the end of the war. And these are all people that are suffering from the war 
and now they're out in the streets protesting injustice that the government has been doing to them and nobody is doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're out on the streets, they're saying, hey, this is not right, but the international community is just like, you know, Dayton works, it's fine. It in, in encourages people of diff different ethnicities to hate each other, but it's fine, it'll work. So how do you, how do I, as a Bosnian citizen and an American citizen, do something about this? I see this injustice and I want to help, but there's, it's almost out of my hands, so I don't know. <laughs> Pray. But I think if you find people who want to work on it with you, you're not, it, it, it's, we can never do enough, mm -hmm. and people are suffering in the world, and it's not okay, and it should never be okay, and we're limited. But I think there are other people who agree with us, and I think when we all work together, the world in general gets a little better. I think people, I think a lot of the evils in the world are a little less than they used to be. Not that they're good, but it's, it, if we all work and find people who agree with us and work together, I think we can make a little bit of a difference. Not fast enough and not enough. I would find one thing that you know you can do, mm -hmm. no matter how small, and do it because it's bothering you. Mm -hmm. Just find one thing that you know you can do, whether it goes down to the Bosnian embassy and, I don't know, do something, but they just find one thing you can do, whether it's contributing to the UN, I don't, you know, I mean, just something that you can feel you're just following, and sometimes if you do one thing that leads you to another and to another. So just maybe taking one step and seeing where it goes. I think sometimes we also, um, when we talk about problems with each other, we feel that that's not really doing anything because we're just talking about it. Um, I would say that if you can convince another of that injustice and that dialogue that you have, that is doing something mm -hmm. because you are now, you have someone who may not have been aware of what is happening or may not have believed that it is injustice uh, is now with you and knows that it is. And I think that um, Karama, we're very um, apolitical to a fault. We don't involve ourselves in anything political. And uh, last month we were invited by a Senate judiciary, uh, to a Senate judiciary hearing on the humanitarian crisis uh, of Syria. And we've been very purposeful in not making a remark one way or the other on what is happening in Syria and yet I felt that if the focus of the hearing really was the humanitarian crisis, then someone needed to say that those aid workers that are supposedly giving um, the coats to people who are, they have had snow and cold temperatures for the first time in God knows how long, um, are being stopped and actually being, are, they're selling their coats mm -hmm. instead of actually giving them away. Um, you know, there are injustices that are happening and we wouldn't know about them unless we watched uh, international news, yeah. you know, and other news sources, for example. And that was something that I felt like that, you know, those people sitting in that Senate Judiciary hearing may not care, it may not do anything, but at least we can say we talked about it. We talked about this is happening and you all don't know about it or at least don't care, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, and then I think that uh, education, um, so Karama, we educate, that's our form of activism. And I often feel, the litigator in me often feels like, where is this education going? I don't see results, you know, I don't get a verdict at the end of the day that says, yes, you win, or no, you lost. You know, you have to wait generations. And I wonder, is this really helping? And yet, when I see just having talked about it, having talked about Islam, for example, and um, to piggyback on what this gentleman was saying, I think uh, one of the pieces of justice that uh, in Islam that is so beautiful to me, and this is a gender piece, is so many want to talk about how women are given less in inheritance, for example. 
Um, what is not talked about is that your father has an obligation to support you. And if you don't have a father, then your mother has an obligation to support you. And your brother, not your mother so much, but your brother has an obligation to support you. And if you don't have a brother, the next man in your family has an obligation to support you. And that is a requirement. So a woman, her money, financial means, is hers and hers alone. She doesn't even have to help her children. She's not obligated to. But the man, there are so many claims against his money that it would be unjust for him not to get a higher portion of the inheritance. And so, yeah, you do have an obligation to your family. And so educating people about your rights, even from a faith perspective, can mean that they go and advocate for those rights from that faith community. So. And it is time. I need to. And I know there are some other questions, but um, if you have more questions, please, you know, the panel is maybe here for a little bit. Um, I, or, yeah, <laughs> and Vati will probably be heading out. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.